Hey folks, welcome to Two Types of Reasoning. Um, this is, of course, going to be based on Chapter 2 in the Reader. And the two types of reasoning we'll be addressing are inductive and deductive. We will have an overview of inductive and deductive in this section, where you just get the basics of the differences between the types of arguments. And then the subsequent two chapters, 3 and 4, will go into depth on deductive and then inductive reasoning. And uh, like I said in the first lecture, and like it says in, like I said in the reading, um, this class is about understanding arguments, and what they are, how to make them, how to recognize them, and how to do them well, how to make them well. Uh, and so by understanding the two different ways that arguments can be constructed, you'll get better at that goal of um, recognizing and making good arguments. So as I said, the, the major ideas we'll be looking at First off, just the major difference between those two types of reasoning. And then we're going to focus in on particular aspects of, of deductive reasoning that are actually very useful and helpful for understanding logic and language and writing in general, and the world in general, frankly. Um, but they're somewhat difficult. So that second major idea there, validity, is one of the most difficult concepts for um, students to understand. And I say that not just based on my experience as a professor, but there's actually literature and research on this because um, it's so hard for some to understand. So now some of you are going to get it and just nail it, right? There's there's certainly a, something to be said about different abilities here. Some people just kind of are you know more easily see that. Uh, just like for me, it was harder to see certain concepts in um, chemistry. Other people kind of just were more easily easily able to see it right away, and that may be true for some of you in validity. But it's very hard for many students. Um, now, validity has to do with the form of an argument, the way the argument is literally put together, like the building blocks, and the um, what we call soundness. An argument that is sound is one that has to do with the content or the truth. So just to keep it simple, validity has to do with form, and soundness has to do with content. Now. Of course, raising the question of truth raises a huge question, doesn't it? Uh, what does it mean to call something true? Now, I've alluded to this before, um, and in this lecture, I will, will uh, address that question head on, um, because that's really an important question for your whole academic career. If you don't think that truth is something that is attainable, if you don't think that truth is objective in some way, and it's all subjective, a view that sometimes called subjective and relativism that we'll talk about, um, then there doesn't seem to be much point in you learning anything. Because if you think it's all relative, uh, no knowledge is good knowledge. It's all just relative to something else, right? Um, so we really have to address head on this this idea of uh, truth and and what it means. And even if we can't all agree on what truth is, I hope you'll find after the discussion and after the lecture that we can make some sort of compromise that allows us to move forward, um, even if we don't all agree precisely on truth. And then finally in this section, we're gonna look at two common argument forms that could actually be inductive or deductive, um, although inference to best explanation is most commonly uh, inductive. Um, but the balance of considerations argument is what it sounds like. It's like making a pro-con list, very common type of reasoning that we're used to. Uh, should I go here or should I go there? Well, I don't want to go here, so I'll go there. Right? Just to uh, keep the simple form. Inference to best explanation is basically making an argument about something that's not yet understood, and you're providing the best possible way to understand it. So you find spilled milk on the ground, say, in, in your floor. And you say, well, I think the cat probably knocked over the bull. Right? That's an argument, inference to best explanation. Notice that maybe that's not the explanation. Maybe milk spilled out of the fridge. You don't know. Maybe your roommate or daughter or son had some milk and spilled it. It may not have been the cat. But the best explanation you have is the cat when you first see it. Uh, so anyways, that's inference to best explanation reasoning. So those are the four uh, kind of central focus areas of focus, the four major ideas for this chapter. Let me remind you a little bit about arguments since this class, perhaps unlike many other philosophy classes, involves is much more like math. Um, it builds upon the previous knowledge you've gained. So if you don't understand what an argument is, if you didn't already understand, um, you got to understand now in order to even move forward 
and the, the subsequent material. So again, an argument is just a series of claims. Remember, claims are just statements of principle, statements. They can, in principle, be true or false, like I have a paper, or I am giving a lecture, um, or there is a picture on the wall over there, and so forth. Um, and when you have an argument, you put two of those claims together in a way that is, they're relevantly connected. I gave the example last time of, it's raining, um, my conclusion, and then my justification for that being, I can see water coming from the sky. Uh, that would be an argument. Now, something that's tricky about arguments is that when, like I've said in the last lecture, sometimes when you're reading a passage or a New York Times article or a blog or whatever it is, uh, it's not laid out clearly what the conclusion and premises are. And that's why classes like this are important because they teach you how to go through and recognize what the person is saying on whatever you're reading. Um, because people make arguments everywhere in the world, right? Politicians, religious folks, everybody. It's not just philosophers who make arguments. It's not just academics. Arguments are everywhere. Um, but what's tricky is that sometimes people, people can mesh arguments together. So they may argue for a point, and then once they've established that point, they'll now use that conclusion and turn it into a premise and a new argument. So, for example, what if I made an argument that said, the brakes aren't working and the transmission needs work, therefore my car has outlived its usefulness. So I'm pointing to my car, I'm giving evidence, and I'm arguing that it's outlived its usefulness because of these, these factors, right? So that's my conclusion, that's my premise, it's relevantly connected, it's an argument. But now let's say I've established, okay, my car has outlived its usefulness. Now I take that claim, which was previously a conclusion, and it becomes a premise. And now I make a new argument, which is the car has outlived its usefulness, therefore I should get a new car, right? So now that's a linked chain of logic, but it's actually two separate arguments that are linked together. So it's just important to note how that can happen. Um, when people write, they'll make arguments, but sometimes they're linked together in a less clear fashion than um, you would want. There can also be unstated premises and conclusions, and um, I'm going to jump ahead to this next PowerPoint to show you this example. So let's imagine, you know, a common situation. Say you're sitting around watching the game with your friends, or you're watching whatever, you know, maybe you're watching the Lord of the Rings, or Marathon, whatever you're doing, Star Wars. You're hanging out with your friends and you're watching something together, and you decide, somebody decides, let's order some pizza. Right? Not an uncommon experience for many of us. And let's say you say this. You say, hey, I'm not calling for the pizza. I called for it last time. Right? You've made an argument. Right? You've given a reason why you're not calling the pizza guy or you're not going to make the delivery or whatever it is to modernize it. You're not going to go onto Grubhub and order the pizza. You say, I did it last time, not doing it again this time. That's your argument. Now notice there's an unstated premise there that you wouldn't say out loud, but would be assumed and understood by most people listening. And that's the premise that is italicized there on the PowerPoint. Anyone who has done something the most recently should not have to do that thing again immediately. So now that we've added this premise, it turns the argument into a deductive one that's linked together um, by the, with the other premise and conclusion, to the other premise and conclusion. So anyways, my point here is that arguments can have assumptions that are made, which typically we call not assumptions, but unstated premises that either the person intended and didn't make clear, or they um, didn't intend, but was implied anyways by the logic they presented. So anyways, that's another aspect of arguments. Now, on this last, just to go back to the other PowerPoint briefly, um, that uh, bullet point there that says what arguments are not. I just want to remind you, remember arguments are not emotional appeals, they are not pathos or logos to go back to the first chapter from Aristotle. Uh, arguments are also not just explanations. An argument can be an inference to the best explanation if you don't have one, but if we already have an explanation it's not an argument. So for example if I know that my car is not starting because the battery died and I already know that, that's not an argument to say the car doesn't run because the battery is dead. That's explaining what we already know. Right? So an argument has to bring you to something new. It can't just re-explain what you already know.
Um, also, arguments are not conditional statements. This can be a misunderstanding. A conditional statement is an if-then statement. If I finish this lecture, then I will get some food. Right? If I watch this lecture, then I will do better on the assessment, and so forth. Um, if I... Uh, if you get high, then you will fail your class, right, or whatever. Or if you get high, you'll do well in your class, whatever it is. That's a conditional statement, but it's not an argument. A conditional statement is one claim. If this happens, that will happen. But remember, an argument has to have at least two claims. So anyways, just a little refresher on arguments. Let's look more head-on at the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning, and let me give you some examples. So I've mentioned before that a deductive argument is one in which the conclusion is certain based on the premises. Now it's very, very common misunderstanding here to assume that when I say a deductive argument is certain, it means that you are certain yourself of the premises. So sometimes students say, well, no, no I'm certain that my argument is true, therefore it's deductive not deductive. Deductive only refers to the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. It's about that relationship of certainty. It's not about your subjective feeling of certainty of the premises. Um, so for example, I can make an argument that says uh, all um, coffee is the best and let me, let's say this, I'm drinking Seattle coffee right now, Seattle's best coffee. All Seattle's best coffee is the best coffee. Let's just say I said that. My second premise would be, um, I am drinking Seattle's best coffee, therefore I am drinking the best coffee. Right? Now, this is a deductive argument, regardless of what you believe about Seattle's best coffee. You might think I'm wrong that all coffee, all Seattle's best is the best coffee, but the way the logic relates together is deductive because if it were true, that, the, that Seattle's best is the best, then all the rest would follow with certainty. So what you should think of an as an argument, an argument is a sophisticated machine that has working parts. It's not just an individual feeling of certainty. Now inductive arguments are different. It's the same sense in which you have to have, it's a structure, it's a complicated machine, but it's different because in an inductive argument, the con con conclusion could go different ways even when the premises are true. So that's the main difference between deductive and inductive, is that in a deductive argument, when the premises are true, it guarantees that the conclusion would also be true if the premises were. But in an inductive argument, even if the premises are absolutely true, it could push out different conclusions. It could draw conclusions that are likely, not necessarily certain. Right? So a deductive argument almost always narrows down to one conclusion. Uh, let me just take the common example, sometimes called a deductive syllogism. Syllogism is just a fancy word for the structure of, of the argument here. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. So Socrates is mortal. Notice how in that case the premises prove the conclusion. If those two things are true, Socrates has got to be mortal if Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, right? Those two first claims, they deductively lead with certainty to the final claim, which is the conclusion. But in an inductive argument, like let's say I said, it rained the last three days, therefore it will rain tomorrow. My premise there, of course, is it rained the last few days, that's my evidence, and my conclusion is it will rain tomorrow. But notice in that case that even if the premises are true, that it rained the last three days, it's not necessarily with certainty that it will rain tomorrow, even if there's a high probability. Even if the weather report says it will, we all know that it's possible that if we thought it was going to rain the next day, it might not. Um, so that room for a probability there is what makes the argument inductive. Okay, so that's the difference. Now, we can also turn arguments from deductive to inductive by uh, um, switching a premise. So let's say, for instance, that um, you know, picture so one of those kind of midwestern houses with uh, 
the porch and you know the old grandpa sitting on the couch and he's not the couch on the on the swinging chair on the porch watching the distance watching off in the distance and he says well rain is coming because i can feel a south wind so grandpa sitting on the porch makes an argument says i think there's rain coming because i can feel a south wind now let's say the question we have as logicians as people who are in a logic class we wonder did he mean that the rain is following with certainty is it absolutely going to come in other words is he making a deductive argument or was he saying that the rain will follow with probability is he making an inductive argument and most likely he was making an inductive argument people in deductive arguments are a little bit of a higher bar and they're made less often in common discourse although they are made but in this case i mean i don't think the the guy on the porch would was saying that there's absolutely never a case you know it's absolutely going to rain he's more saying that well based on the evidence i see of this wind rain is probably coming so what i'm speaking to here is that last bullet point on the powerpoint that says we can turn inductive and deductive arguments um, back and forth by s switching unstated premises. So if I take the man on the porch's argument, it, if, if I want to make it deductive, I would say, I would add the unstated premise that every time there is a south wind, rain follows. Notice that now I've turned the logic to deductive because now the structure, the form is one where if the premises are true, the conclusion would follow with certainty. But what if I said, most of the time, there's a south wind, rain is on its way. Again, that's the way I would assume he's probably intending it, and the unstated premise there would be the most. So the point is that part of evaluating an argument comes down to the intentions of the speaker, too. The logic of the argument is most of it, right? Most of the time, you can just look at the argument. Do they use terms like all, most, none? How is the logic connected? Is it relevant? And so forth. Where's the controversial conclusion? Most of the time, that's the case. Um, but sometimes we don't know what the speaker intended. And that's why I gave you this example of the old man on the porch, because I can kind of guess where he's coming from. But um, part of the evaluation of an argument depends on what did the speaker intend? And one way to get closer to that is, especially if you know the person making the argument, you can ask them, hey, are you saying this is always the case, or are you saying most of the time? Right? What, what are you really saying here? Um, so one more time, part of the evaluation of whether an argument is inductive or deductive comes down to the speaker's intentions. And those intentions can be gotten by asking. Um, but uh, sometimes, and many times, you can tell the speaker's intentions just by the context of the passage of where they're coming from you can tell what they're intending. And in the uh, questions on the assessments, the intentions of the speaker will be made clear to you. Um, so don't worry about that. Okay. So let's look at some deductive arguments. Let's go into a bit more depth on deduction here. Because like I said, we're going to hone in on this aspect of deductive arguments called validity, and this will help to clarify in more depth um, what kind of arguments those are, uh, how validity works. So let's look at a definition. And I want to be clear, we're now honing in, homing in on deductive reasoning. So forget about the probability stuff for a minute, that's inductive, let's focus in on certainty. And validity is only a feature of deductive arguments. So I don't want to hear anybody write or say, this was a valid argument if it's inductive. It does not apply to inductive reasoning. The way we evaluate inductive reasoning, as we'll talk about later, is based on strength or weakness. Um, that's the only consideration. But with deductive arguments, the considerations are validity and soundness. So let's talk about those. So validity is a particular condition in which if you assume the premises to be true, the conclusion would follow with certainty. Now notice my use of if and would. This is what's called counterfactual reasoning. And this is what's so difficult for many students to see here, is that I'm saying if these things were true, whether or not they are actually true is an, is not, does not matter to validity. Validity, we merely assume 
that what the speaker has given to us in his argument or her argument is correct. We assume the truth of what's being given to us, even if it's ridiculous, because that will tell us if the logic they've presented even makes sense to begin with, if the logic is even valid. The next step, soundness, is where we start thinking about, is it actually true? But before we get there, to slow our thinking down, which is what we're doing in this class, we have to first assume that these premises given to us are true, even if we know they're not. And this is the tricky part. There's something counterintuitive here, seemingly counterintuitive, but it's actually very intuitive when you think through it and when you think slowly about it. Um, we assume they're true even if we don't know if they're true or if they're obviously false. We, in other words, we give the speaker the benefit of the doubt. And we say, okay, I'm going to assume what you gave me. You gave me a bunch of crap. I'm going to assume what you gave me makes sense, and I'm going to find the best example of your logic here. That's what it means to determine if an argument is valid or invalid. So the premise cannot be false in a valid argument if, I'm sorry, the conclusion cannot be false if the premises are assumed true. They cannot be false. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples. Let's say I said, first premise, all women get pregnant, Susanna is a woman, so Susanna will get pregnant. Now right away, if I asked you, valid or invalid? Some of you are gonna say invalid and you'd be wrong. And the reason you're gonna say invalid is because you're thinking to yourself, but wait a minute, all women do not get pregnant. Some women don't have kids, right? You're thinking the first premise didn't make sense. But you would have misunderstood what I just said before. What I just said before was that even if the premise doesn't make sense in content, we assume for the sake of the argument that it's true. So even though I know that the first premise is false, I still assume that it's true. So believe it or not, this is actually a valid argument. Because if it were true, remember I said counterfactual, thinking about what would have happened, what, what may have happened if something else was the case. If this were true, then, that's the way we're thinking right now. If it were true that all women get pregnant, we know it's not, but if it were, we're assuming it's true for the sake of the logic. If it were true that all women get pregnant and Susanna is a woman, then it would have to also be true that Susanna will get pregnant, right? Notice that, in a, in a sense, the conclusion is already entailed by the premises. It's, you almost don't even have to state it. It's almost part of the logic that came before. And that's a feature of deductive reasoning is that deductive reasoning, it already contains the truth within the premises. And the conclusion sort of gets pushed out automatically. If you can imagine as a machine just pushing out conclusions, it gets pushed out automatically. Whereas an inductive argument, it doesn't get pushed out it points to different directions that might be the case. But with a deductive argument, the truth of the conclusion is contained within the premises in a sense. So that would be a valid argument, even though the first premise is false. Right? So again, you've got to understand the difference between assumed truth and actual truth to really get this material. Now, yeah, actually, let me, let me, you know what, let me talk while I'm doing this. I'm going to add in the soundness part to each. I'm going to analyze three other arguments here. And I'm going to add in the part about soundness um, to put it all in one. So one more time, to have a valid argument, it's about form. If the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion um, must be true also. It cannot be false if the premises are assumed to be true. Soundness, though, is about whether the premises are actually true. So when we evaluate a deductive argument, we first figure out, does the form make sense? If I assume the premise is true, would the conclusion follow? We figure, figure that out first. If we find that the argument is valid, that the conclusion would be true, has to be true if the premises are, then we've completed task number one, and we, now we move on to task number two, which is, is the logic sound? Does the logic make sense? Does the, do, are the claims true? So in other words, the analysis for the argument I just gave you 
about women getting pregnant would be it's a valid but unsound argument. It's valid because the form of the logic makes sense, but it's not sound because the premises are not actually true. So in other words, it's a bad argument. It's an argument with good form because it's valid, but bad meaning because the content isn't true. Right? So now we're done evaluating the argument. Now notice that I hope you're a little happier now because when I first said, well, this is a valid argument, some of you were like, well, how could, that, how could a good label apply to something that is clearly wrong? Um, and the answer is that to think slowly, you've got to distinguish between different categories. And we're distinguishing between the category of form and content. And yes, it was wrong in content, but it was good in form. And it's important to be able to recognize that difference to be able to reason well, which is a major goal of this class. Let's look at another example. So first premise, if I throw a ball up into the air, it will go up into space. I threw a ball up into the air, therefore it's going to go up into space. Okay. So we have another valid and unsound argument, don't we? because it presents a basic conditional statement, and in a conditional statement, remember, that's an if-then. A conditional statement, it's a clear valid argument. If I say, if X happens, then Y will happen, that means that if X did happen, Y has to happen, because they're linked, um, they're, they're linked together. If one occurs, the other one must occur. That's what it means to, to have a conditional statement. One is a condition upon the other. Uh, so that's a valid argument, because it says that if we throw a ball into the air, it will go into space. We threw it into the air, so it will go into space. It's a valid argument. The form makes sense, but it's unsound. Why? Because we know that there's gravity on the planet Earth and that throwing a ball into the air doesn't mean it goes into space. So if it were true that when you throw a ball into the air, it goes into space, then the conclusion would fall with certainty. It's not true, so the conclusion is false, right? actually, um, because the premise is false, actually. So we have another valid, good form argument, bad content, unsound. One more time, valid and unsound. How about this one? If I set off a bomb in my car, the car will explode. My car exploded, thus I set off a bomb in my car. This is trickier, and this one is invalid. And the reason for that is that the first premise says that if the first thing happens, if I set off a bomb, then the car will explode. But it doesn't say that's the only way the car will explode. It just says if that thing happens, then it will explode as a result of that first thing. But notice the second premise doesn't say anything about setting off a bomb. The second premise just points to the car exploding. So for, in, for instance, it's, it's possible for your car to explode for other reasons, right? Maybe you didn't set off a bomb, maybe someone else did. Maybe your engine malfunctioned and it exploded. Um, there's other ways that your car could have exploded. So this is actually an invalid argument because even if we assume the premise is true, that if I set off a bomb, the car will explode and my car exploded, it's not necessarily certain that I set off a bomb in my car because there could have been different ways that led to the explosion of my car based on the logic presented. Now, I hope you can see the trick here in the form. Notice how they took what's called the consequent or the second part of the first premise and they put that in, this, in the, um, I'm sorry, yeah, the second part of the first premise and they put that in the second premise. And compare that to the previous argument that took the first part of the first premise, which is called the antecedent. Those terms are defined in the readings. Um, and they put that in the second premise. So, um, in any case, the point is, is that even if we assume the premises to be true, the conclusion would not follow. So this is an invalid argument. And um, it's pretty clear, going back to the speaker's intentions, it's pretty clear that the speaker intended that this is deductive. He's trying to draw a certain conclusion, but he fails to do that. So an invalid argument is not inductive if the speaker clearly intended it to be deductive. It's just invalid, end of story, you know, good try at argumentation, go back to the drawing board. It's just an invalid argument. Um, so it doesn't go anywhere. It's not even as good as an argument that's valid and unsound. It doesn't even reach that stage because the logic itself does not fit together properly. Right? It is not 
a, a valid argument. There isn't a good form to the argument. Here's another example of an invalid argument. First premise, all dogs are mammals. Rover is a mammal. Conclusion, therefore, ro Rover is a dog. Now again, the, the use of the terms all and the kind of tightly knit sense of the logic suggests the speaker is intending certainty to the conclusion. And the logic itself um, seems to be based on a deductive organization. Uh, it's a more specific conclusion. It's narrowing down. So I'm getting a sense of deductive reasoning from the logic. The problem is it's invalid, right? Because it says all dogs are mammals, but it doesn't say that all mammals are dogs. So the first premise says all dogs are mammal, but Rover is a mammal. It wouldn't follow with certainty that Rover is a dog, though, would it? Because there's many different types of mammals besides dogs. What if Rover is a mouse, for example? Right. So the conclusion, I'm sorry, the argument leaves open different possibilities for the conclusion. So it's an invalid argument. Now again, we might be tempted to say it's inductive, but it partially comes down to the intentions of the speaker. And as I just argued, the intentions of the speaker here are clearly deductive. So we would not call this an inductive argument. It would be a failed deductive argument. It would be invalid, invalid argument. Okay, so after those examples, I want to give you some um, historical examples. And uh, one in particular from the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and this is a famous debate about slavery. And what's so fascinating to me about this debate, well, there's lots of fascinating things about it, um, but what's so fascinating is that uh, we have an example of how logic played a role in the abolition of slavery. Um, because this was a speech that was heard by many people, and many people were influenced by it. And Lincoln basically took on one of Douglas's arguments. Douglas was arguing for slavery, of course, and Lincoln was arguing against it. And one of Douglas's arguments presented in the debate, you can see depicted on the PowerPoint. And Douglas basically says, okay, here's my argument. Nothing in the Constitution can destroy a right expressed in the Constitution, right? So in other words, if a right is given in the Constitution, it cannot be denied. The right of property in a slave is affirmed in the Constitution, right? Therefore, nothing can destroy the right of property in the slave. So the first thing to notice here is that this is a valid argument, right? And again, I know there's that tricky part where you're like, but no, he's arguing for slavery. Forget about the content right now. Just think about the form. If we assume the premise is true, would the conclusion follow with certainty? And the answer is yes, it would. So this is a valid argument. But what uh, Lincoln pointed out in the debate, he came back with, yes, Mr. Douglas, the logic is, sa is valid, but your premises are untrue. And he argued against the second premise. He said that there is not a part of the Constitution that distinctly affirms the right of property in a slave. Right? He, said, he denied that. He said, I agree with you with the first premise that um, nothing can destroy a right expressed in the Constitution, but you're incorrect. The Constitution gives us a right to own people, basically, is what Lincoln said. So to use our terminology, Lincoln was saying, Douglas, you presented a valid argument that's good in form, but you've presented an unsound argument that's bad in content. So ultimately, he said, your argument fails. It is not a good argument. Um, so argumentation has an influence, not just in philosophy classes, but far, far beyond. It has great implications for how we advance as a people. Um, you know, Lincoln used logic to argue against slavery. Now, I present a couple other examples in the reader, too. I think one about abortion. Um, and so it's a good idea to really immerse yourself in this material, especially if validity isn't clear to you at this point. Um, and the more examples you see, the more you'll start seeing the separation between the soundness and the actual truth and evaluating the premise versus the validity and evaluating the form and the way the words and the logic work together. Um, and to be a good critical thinker, you've got to be able to see that difference. Okay, but we're going to take a step back from the more concrete arguments, and we're going to do a little bit of a discussion on truth. <laughs>
And what I do in my face-to-face -face class here is I ask my students to free write and reflect upon truth. So I'm going to throw up the free write that I normally give to them here. And it's up to you whether you want to do that. I strongly recommend you at least reflect on it, even if you don't actually write something. Um, reflect on these questions of, if you could, how would you define truth? Um, how does truth relate to certainty? Uh, how do you know something is true? What are the things that you would consider truths? Is there a difference between, say, personal truth and a collective truth and objective truth and subjective truth? Just, you know, let your mind wander with truth. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you three viewpoints from three very influential, um, well, some influential philosophers, but three very influential points of view on truth. And then we're going to try to synthesize them and come to some sort of agreement so we can move forward in the class without getting bogged down on questions of truth. But it's very important to at least dive down this rabbit hole of truth before we get there. So here's some questions also that help people get at what I'm getting at here. So if we're trying to figure out what is true, one way to do that is to think of what can we doubt, right? Because if you can't doubt something, it would suggest it's true, right? Like if I, it would be hard for me to doubt that I'm holding this paper right in front of me, wouldn't it? So in some sense, I would argue to myself then, well, it's true that I'm holding the paper because it's really hard for me to doubt that it's here. But on the other hand, what kind of stuff can we doubt? Well, we can doubt that the government is saying people do that all the time, have been doing that forever. Um, and there's certainly justification for doing that. There have been documented cases of government lies and deception. Of course, you can doubt what's written in textbooks. Many textbooks have been written in the past, for example, by racists, by sexists, by um, people who were very misinformed about certain things. Uh, they have their own biases and perspectives and worldviews, of course. Um, of course, you can doubt what you get on the internet because the internet has so many diverse sources and people coming together from all different levels and cultural backgrounds. Of course, you can doubt that. Of course, we all doubt what other people say. We may have people that we respect more than others, we're more likely to listen to, but it's very easy to doubt people. We know people are motivated as we are by selfishness, by desire to be right, and my desire to advance our own interests and um, the desire to be liked and to fit in and so forth. Um, but what about, it gets a little more crazy when we talk about some of these other things. So what about the existence of places we haven't visited, right? I've never been to Australia. Does that mean Australia doesn't exist because I haven't been there, right? Isn't it possible that all the pictures of Australia I've seen have been faked? Obviously, I don't really believe that, but my point is, is that part of our knowledge of the world is a direct, immediate knowledge, and seeing is believing, right? It's a common phrase. So if I haven't actually been somewhere, you know, there's some argument to be made that, well, it's not there. I haven't experienced it. This is exactly what leads people to doubt the moon landing was real, you know, because we can all conceive of how it would be possible to set up the moon in a studio. And um, again, I'm not saying I believe that either, but... I understand the process of skepticism and doubt that one could go through here. And ultimately, going back to my paper example, there are people who have doubted the very information of our senses. Um, and uh, there are people who have said our senses are in fact quite unreliable. And we're about to look at one of those arguments very soon here. And not only that, but we can be deceived about our memories, right? We can remember things very differently than the way they actually went. And when we talk about credibility later in the class, we'll touch more on memory. So I'll save my arguments there until that point. So let's go into this famous argument from um, René Descartes, who's a famous French philosopher, very influential in our current Western culture, still studied to this day. And Descartes' argument is an argument about certainty. And this is why I asked you about the relationship between truth and certainty. So what Descartes decides to do is he says, I want to figure out how to find a foundation in this new developing thing, which today we call science. Back then, he was living at the time of the scientific revolution or the Western Enlightenment. And so he was one of the people who were developing what we today call the scientific method. 
And what he wanted to do was find a foundation for that method. Uh, and so what he decided is he said, I think I'm going to just kind of lock myself off in my room, tell people not to bother me, not to disturb me, and I'm just going to start doubting whatever the hell I can. And he said, I I'm going to doubt rationally and logically and consistently, and I'm going to be honest with myself, and I'm not going to succumb to emotion. I'm just going to look at things and be as objective as I can, and I'm going to start doubting. And he said, you know what? Whatever is left after I doubt, whatever foundation remains after this process of doubt, that will be the ultimate truth. So I just want to point out this is Descartes' method, and sometimes this is called the um, uh, method of skepticism or the um, meth methodic radical doubt, methodic doubt. Uh, it's a met whatever whatever name we use. It's a method and it's a controlled way of doubting. Right? Point A. I'm gonna I'm gonna consider this. Can I think this is certain? No, I can't. I'm gonna move on to the next thing and so forth. So this is again why it's kind of important to do that free write I asked you to do before. Try to go through the same process with yourself and literally go down to every possible thing you could doubt. And go as far as you can. And what do you end up with? Let's see if you ended up somewhere that Descartes did. So Descartes, first off, um, uh, certainly one of his unstated premises in the argument is that anything that can be doubted is not certain. He, he goes in with that attitude. If I can doubt it, it's not certain. I'm rejecting it. So in other words, l let me distinguish here before we get any further. Even if something is very likely, that's not the same as certain. Right? Descartes is looking for deductive certainty. This is a deductive argument. He's looking for a conclusion that cannot be doubted. He's not looking for something that's likely the case. So remember, when he's rejecting things here, he's rejecting them not because he thinks they're, un you know, they're not likely, it's because he thinks they're not certain. And that's a very important distinction. So the first thing he looks at is his senses. And he says, well, what's the first foundation for certainty that people often point to? What's the first thing I said here when I first mentioned the paper? I said, well, I can see and touch and feel and so forth this paper so I know it's real. Now Descartes is questioning that very thing. He's saying, but wait a minute, you might, it might be likely that you're holding a piece of paper, but your senses deceive you in other cases, so how can you be so certain of them in that case? And what he has in mind there is, as it says on the second premise there, optical illusions, dreams, you know, drug experiences even, when we shift in between and out of reality. Um, Remember, like I was just saying, he's after absolute certainty. And he's not saying our senses aren't reliable, but reliable ain't certain, right? They're reliable, but they also fail us. You know, a mirage in the desert is another example. There's all these great optical illusions where, you know, lines seem to be curved, but they're actually straight, but just because of the way something is placed and um, our senses play tricks on us. Also, dreams. Descartes specifically talks about dreams. Um, isn't it true that, I mean, what, what's the reason why nightmares exist? Nightmares exist because we believe it's real when it's happening, right? We're dreaming, but we think we're in real life. Um, so right there is a misunderstanding of reality. And vice versa, there are times when, I don't know if you guys have had this experience, where it's kind of late at night, maybe you're nodding off, you're really tired, you're watching TV and working on something, and you kind of go in and out of consciousness, you're falling asleep on the couch, and maybe something happened that you're actually not sure if you dreamed it or if it happened. Like, I remember one time I was living with roommates at the time, and I wasn't sure if my roommate actually came home or if I dreamed that he came home. I really, I really didn't know. Um, or not came home, but if he came into the kitchen to get some food or not. And anyways, my point is that our senses ain't perfect, and they might be reliable, Descartes didn't deny that, but clearly they're not a foundation for certainty, right? If there's any room for doubt, rejection of them as being certain. So Descartes says, nope, senses can be doubted. They are not a foundation for certainty. Now right there, that is a huge, huge thing to say, because it leads us down the road of things like the matrix, um, you know, living in a simulation, which people are taking more seriously these days. Uh, because if our senses can be doubted, that means everything I'm seeing and observing 
you know, you guys could all be robots, we could all be living in a false reality, right? There's a whole rabbit hole that could go down. And uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later, maybe. But for now, let's just content ourselves with the idea that Descartes says, nope, they can't be certain. Now, his next premise is a little bit more, even more crazy, if you can imagine it. Because what's the next thing that people might say is certain? Well, if your senses are certain, right, if you're certain what you're observing around you, then wouldn't math be even more certain? You know, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, mathematical formulas, the laws, you know, of nature that are written out in a mathematical formula, the uh, theory of relativity, for example, those equations, the equations of quantum mechanics, aren't those things absolutely certain? Even if my senses doubt me, right, even if our senses doubt us, wouldn't math be certain? Well, Descartes considers it and he says, ultimately, no. And the reason he says that, and this is where it gets crazy, he says, because I can conceive of a powerful being like God, but by the same token, I can also conceive that there may exist a powerful being like God who's evil. Right? So an evil God. Not quite like the devil. The devil has a different characterization in Christianity and Islam. It's, it's an all-powerful being who's like God, but wants to mess with you. Kind of like if God were a little kid with a magnifying glass torching the ants from the sun. Right? It's a scary thing to think about. But Descartes' point is that if such a being did exist, it's certainly possible that that being could change my mind about math. Because if that being were all-powerful, he would have dominion and control over all aspects of reality. So he could make me believe whatever I want to believe. And that means that when, I, when we believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4, Descartes says, for all we know, 2 plus 2 actually equals 5, but somehow the evil genius has manipulated our brains to believe the wrong thing. Now, I know this gets a little crazy, but Descartes' point here isn't that there is an evil genius, necessarily. He's just saying that if there were, if even the remote possibility of one suggests that our math is not certain as we think it is. Right? Again, he's not denying that math is probably, you know, likely to be true. He's just saying that it's possible that it's not. And because he's looking for the absolute 100% certainty, if there's the tiniest possibility of doubt, he's going to reject it. So he says, no, even mathematical scientific truths are not certain because of the possibility of an evil genius. Now, I just want to do a little pushback here because a lot of times when students hear this, they say, what a crazy motherfucker. This guy just comes up with the evil genius. I, like, what the hell, right? There are some people who just say, like, all this other stuff he says is interesting, but all of a sudden he throws in an evil genius? Where does he come up with this? Um, and I get that. But I also want to point out that it's not that much different than considering God. God is an all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing being by most considerations, in the Western world anyways. The evil genius is an all-powerful, all-knowing, but not all-loving being, right? So we're going to change one adjective and it's that weird or that much different? I mean, if you're going to believe in a supernatural being, whether it's evil or good, they're both a little bit strange beliefs from a different perspective. Um, so anyways, I get the weirdness of the evil genius, but I don't think it's that much different than thinking about other um, metaphysical ideas like the traditional Western concept of God. I'd be open to counter-arguments there. But in any case, Descartes rejects the two most obvious foundations for certainty that we could ever imagine, right? And those are what we observe right in front of us and feel and taste and touch and so forth, our senses, and also what we have discovered through science are mathematical truths. And he says, nope, they might be reliable, they're not certain. But what is then? Even if there is an evil genius who is controlling our every thought and is playing with us like toys, you know, like puppets. We're puppets and he's got the strings and he's manipulating our minds. Even if that's true, is there, would there still be anything else that we could know with certainty? If, if, all, if we can't be certain of our senses nor of math and science, what can we be certain of? Well, Descartes said 
actually, there is something that's left. There is one ultimate certainty, and this is the certainty that his deductive argument points us to. He reminds us that our internal thoughts are always present, regardless of anything that happens externally. We always know that we have internal thoughts. The process of thinking is always directly immediate to us. In fact, that's one of the beauties, isn't it? Is that you can think whatever you want and no one can ever, ever know except you. So we have this internal space of thinking that is very personal. And Descartes says, well, so that shows us that on some level we exist. There are, there is something that it is like to be us. We have thoughts. So those, the presence of those thoughts, even if we are in the matrix, we are in a simulation, even if two plus two does not equal four, we still know with certainty that we have thoughts and that's enough to know we exist. Now, some of you might be thinking, but wait a minute, can't we apply that same method of doubt to thinking? Couldn't we just say, well, no, 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 I just doubt that I'm thinking. But Descartes is very tricky here and he anticipates that objection. And he says, no, because doubting is a form of thinking. So if you're saying, I doubt that I'm thinking, you're actually contradicting yourself because to doubt is to think. The mere fact that you're having any thoughts at all is itself proof that you think. It's itself proof that you exist as something. You don't know what. You could be tied up in a vat like the guys in the matrix. You could be experiencing a completely false generated world, but you still exist. So Descartes isn't saying he knows what you exist as, He's not saying your particular existence is certain. He's saying that the fact of thinking, the fact of existence is certain. That's the only thing. Bare bones existence. You know you exist as something, but that's it. Right. Um, so, and this is depicted, by the way, in that image, the reason I use it on the right, that says, I think, therefore I am, inside the guy's head. Because this is something you have to appreciate personally. This is an argument that applies to all humans, but it's introspective because you have to look at your own process of thinking and ask yourself, is Descartes right about this? Uh, now, most people who look at this say on some level, Descartes is right. On some level, our thinking is very immediately accessible to us. And on some level, it's the most certain thing about our lives. Um, but there have been counter arguments to Descartes. There have been people who, for instance, added in thinking and feeling. They say, well, feeling is also immediately certain. Like, feeling isn't necessarily external, right? You feel an emotion from the inside, too. Um, however we conceive it, the idea that existence is the one absolute certainty, this has been a very resonant and important and powerful argument um, that has influenced us for many years. And it's caused some people to go crazy. This is actually the argument that somewhat got me into philosophy. Um, you know, some people hear this and they don't take it very seriously. And they say, eh, whatever, I'm here, it doesn't matter. I took it very seriously and I, and I said, you know, this guy's making some fair points here about what I can consider to be real, what I can consider to be true. So anyways, um, in terms of our class, let me, let me go back to the bigger picture. We're trying to investigate what is true and we're trying to come up with a definition of truth that works or that makes sense. And Descartes' definition basically identifies truth with certainty. He says, well, if we want, if, if truth is what's absolutely certain, we can really only be certain of one thing. And that's, again, that we exist. But what if truth doesn't have to be so highfalutin? What if truth isn't just about certainty? What if it's more about, you know, sometimes it's about certainty, but sometimes it's about probability, right? What if truth is more dynamic than that? And so... Um, you'll see, I, I think in the reading, uh, I, I have a section or at least I have a, a part where I talk about truth beyond certainty. Um, and so that's what we'll look at now. Right? So remember, Descartes didn't deny that our senses are reliable. He would have said scientific instruments that were developed during his time were reliable. He's just saying they weren't the ultimate certainty. But if we weaken our understanding of truth to account for more than certainty, we can now move beyond Descartes. Right? So we can say, okay, Descartes, you made a fair point. We're going to move forward. And what happens when we go beyond certainty? Well, that takes us to the scientific method, doesn't it? So the number one answer that most people give, I think, um, 
that's just my impression. I don't have a study on that. I'm just suggesting that. It's my opinion. Uh, the, the thing that most people say when they're asked how we discover what's true is the scientific method. And why is that? Well, it's because the scientific method basically extends the evidence of our senses and of our minds, right? It's, the scientific method involves both inductive and deductive reasoning. Um, it involves reasoning about accepted principles and understood concepts, but it also involves empiricism, which, is, which means studying the natural world, the philosophy we'll study later in the class. Uh, so, so, I'm sorry, we won't study, I was thinking I'm teaching another class. We won't study empiricism directly in here, but empiricism just means to study the natural world. And pretty much every scientist today is an empiricist on some level. So anyway, the scientific method gets us to truth. And uh, how does it do that? Well, as you can see on the PowerPoint here, like I said, um, it uses logical arguments, experiments, but also aspects of science are theorizing about what may or may not be the case and testing your theories and peer review, uh, um, writing in journals and getting critiqued by other scientists in a positive way. These are all parts of science. And, and the idea is that this whole process removes human bias to the best of its ability and gets us closer to the truth. Right. So that's the idea, truth beyond certainty, the scientific method. But sorry guys, this is a philosophy class, so I'm even going to shed some doubt on the scientific method. And we're now getting to a view of truth called relativism. And some have argued and one famous philosopher who argued this is a guy named Thomas Kuhn, who wrote one of the most influential books of the last 50 or 60 years. And that book is called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And again, we're trying to figure out what truth is. And if our answer is to reject Descartes and say, okay, Descartes, truth is something beyond certainty. And we say, science isn't certain, it's about probability, and it gives us the best evidence and we point to science, well now, Thomas Kuhn comes along and says, well, I hate to break it to you guys, but when we observe the way science actually works, it's not this perfectly objective process of finding truth that everyone thinks. In other words, Thomas Kuhn finds a lot of subjectivity and relativism in science. And what he means by that is that when science is done, there's a group of people who basically are the gatekeepers and they're typically white men actually even to this day and they're the ones who decide what projects get funded they're the ones who decide how much money gets given uh, to particular foundations and universities and so forth they're the ones who decide what ideas get accepted by the community um, for example each major discipline in science you know like Psychology, for instance, has the American Psychological Association. Philosophy has the American Philosophical Association. The gatekeepers, Kuhn would argue, are the ones sitting on the boards of those organizations and determining how philosophy gets done, how psychology gets done, how physics gets done. And every time there's a new theory that goes against the grain of the gatekeepers, they tend to get defensive and to, even if the new theory has merit, they tend to push it out or to not give it as much chance as it deserves. And so notice that what's happening here, science does not, it's not linear. The, the traditional view of science is sort of like, well, you know, a scientist has his lab coat and he observes coldly from afar and he figures out how things work and he writes up his paper and then we advance. But Kuhn says it's not like that at all. There's a whole group of gatekeepers who actually control whether the research can even start to begin with. And they have their own biases and assumptions to begin with too. So he calls this a paradigm, the worldview that the scientists hold. And a paradigm is, involves a number of different things. It involves assumptions about metaphysics and epistemology and values even. Um, but it also involves the correct methods, like what's, like for example, should we use rat studies where we study rats, or should we study human behavior? Should we use computer models or you know um, egg cultures or something? What, how should we figure these things out? The top scientists get to decide what ways we do it, and they're the ones who decide whether new ways are going to work or not. Um, so the scientific community 
basically these different influential communities within science, they determine what becomes known to be truth. And notice right there what that suggests. It suggests a degree of relativism because these different paradigms in science can conflict. They conflict and they don't always agree. Right? So this would suggest actually that truth, even in science, isn't some objective thing. It's actually relative to the community within science. Right? There's no independent universal standard. Everything's defined by the rules of the particular current paradigm. Okay, so this is relativism in science. Now, I want to point out that it's fair to Thomas Kuhn to point this out, that Kuhn actually denied he was saying that science is relative. Although many of his critics said, yeah, but even if you deny it, your theory still suggests that. So Kuhn pushed back against the claim to relativism. He said he still believed there was some objective truth there. He just thought it was much harder to come across than we typically think. Um, but either way, there are disagreements even on Kuhn's theory. Now, I always like to point to this part of my favorite show, Rick and Morty, or one of my favorite new shows. And um, there's a part where, uh, so first of all, if you haven't seen the show, it's just a comedy cartoon kind of taking off on the dynamic between, like if you ever saw Back to the Future, between um, uh, Marty and uh, Doc, the kind of old wise doctor, and the younger kid who's his protege, and they go on adventures together. And Rick and Morty is a parody of that, where Rick is kind of the doctor and Morty is the kid. And, um, and it's obviously dirty and a, a comedy, so it plays with that theme. Um, but there's a funny, there's one episode where um, Rick, the doctor guy, you know, or the, the scientist, uh, he creates a serum that's supposed to help everyone get back to normal after they had caused some problems on this planet, and it ends up turning people into mutants instead and then Morty gets mad at Rick because he says what the hell you're turning people into mutants and then Rick responds with sometimes science is more art than science Morty a lot of people don't get that right and I quote that because that's more or less what Thomas Kuhn is saying he's saying scientists pretend it's all rational and re you know rationality and reason but there's actually a lot of emotion and irrationality and art to science right sometimes people are just doing what they believe feels the best and they're not actually paying attention to truth, those people who are in charge of those paradigms. Uh, so, so anyways, there's that. Now let me give you just a couple examples of paradigm shifts, just in case that wasn't clear. Um, and I'll start with an obvious one. So the flat earth paradigm versus the round earth paradigm. Now I'd first point out that the whole idea that we used to think the earth was flat and then suddenly you know, we discovered it was round is actually incorrect. Um, there may have been pockets of small cultures that didn't have, uh, you know, small villages that didn't have connect too much, too many connections with larger communities, larger cities. There may have been small villages that believed the earth was flat, but even the ancient Greeks knew the earth was round. I mean, they had written about it and some of the early theorists talked about it. So it's not quite the case that, you know, we suddenly went as a, as a humans from believing that it was flat and to suddenly seeing the truth of it. It shifted around and it depended on the part of history that you're referring to. But to be fair, there are two paradigms. Um, and so you, of course, have the flat earth paradigm. It says, hey, the earth is flat. This paradigm does make some observable predictions. The earth looks pretty flat when you stare out ahead of it, doesn't it? I mean, as long as you're not in the ocean and you don't look way off into the horizon and see the curvature, it looks pretty flat, right? So it, it fits some predictions. And there's a certain intuition that makes it seem right, because it's weird to think that we're walking around in this huge ball, you know, this huge spherical structure called the Earth, um, because it's hard for us to understand scale, right? So it seems right intuitively that we have this sense that we're walking on flat ground, that we're actually walking on, you know, fully flat ground. Uh, so the crucial thing to see there is that within that paradigm, there's actually some predictions that make sense. Even if ultimately we know it's wrong, there, from within the paradigm, there are some predictions, some ideas that make sense. Likewise, within the round earth paradigm, right, it makes observable predictions, um, right, the theory is that it's basically round, and the difference here, though, is that it can be arrived at with math and geometry, and that's actually one of the things the ancient Greeks did, 
they used uh, I, I forgot I forgot his name, but one of the ancient Greeks he did the thing where he put a stick in one part of the earth and another stick here, and then he measured the differences in shadows over the time of the day and found you know some sort of a you know I can't remember the details, but he used math and geometry to show that there was curvature to the Earth's surface, and so those are two paradigms that conflict, and from within each paradigm there's some degree of truth. Right? This is Kuhn's point. Let's move forward. This is one of my favorites because a lot of people don't know this example. We used to, in the 1800s, it used to be a major theory in science that was taken seriously by many legitimate scientists that electricity was a fluid. It's called the fluidity theory of electricity. You can look this up. And they believed that what was happening um, was when, you know, what we now dis uh, discuss today as different charges, they thought there was some sort of undetectable liquid that was being shifted instead of charges. And it was complicated, you know, different theorists had different ways of marking out their theory. And it actually led to some inventions. This is the crazy thing. To, it led to a leaden jar, which was an early capacitor that's a huge part of so many electronics today. A capacitor is. Uh, so this is the tricky thing. Even in a theory that today we don't believe, it still made observable predictions and it still made some sense. So this is all supporting Kuhn's point that science isn't always objective. Right? And, and in order for us to move to the electromagnetism paradigm that we accept today, there had to be this huge battle between the cultural warriors and giants who believed in the fluidity theory. It wasn't just an immediate shifting, right? They, Imagine that you're somebody who grows up and you become a scientist and for 30 years you believe that electricity is a fluid. All your research is based on that. And you have these young scientists coming in and saying, actually, I think it's more like charges. Right? Can you imagine 30 years of your life spent? I mean, this is what Kuhn is talking about, that so much of science comes down to personality and bias in the very scientists themselves. This is why the charge of relativism is um, present here. Now the third one, the third example I'm going to use here is one that we're currently still going through. And this one fascinates me because I grew up being told that the calorie paradigm was objective fact. And um, people for years were saying fat makes you fat, you've got to run to get rid of it, um, and so forth. And it, there was studies supporting it. It makes common sense, right? The idea is that we eat too much and we don't exercise enough. Um, there are observable predictions. However, I always remember that there were conflicts with this theory. There's always those people who can eat whatever they want and they don't exercise and they don't get unhealthy and they don't gain weight, right? That doesn't fit the paradigm. And we always just explain those people as being, oh, their metabolism is different. Um, but the fat paradigm was actually never fully verified experimentally. People forget that, the calorie paradigm. It was more or less just assumed and it goes back to what Kuhn was saying. It was assumed by top scientists and anybody who disagreed was often ridiculed or they weren't allowed to publish their papers. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that we started, um, people, legitimate scientists started questioning it and saying, hey guys, there's all these other experiments we've run that conflict with the calories paradigm. And so that's why today you hear people talking about carbs. And that's another paradigm sometimes called the hormone paradigm which is the idea that it's the wrong carbohydrates that cause weight gain, not the amount of food. So notice that's a different in theory about what causes us to gain weight. Um, and it also makes observable predictions. There are also scientific studies that support it, just like the calorie paradigm. Um, however, it also has not been verified experimentally. Right? So we're actually right in the middle of a paradigm shift in health. And this is exactly what Kuhn was describing. And there is so much emotion and there is so much personality difference among the top scientists that um, it really is proving Kuhn's point here. Now, whether it proves that scientists is relative is another question, but it certainly Kuhn, regardless of what you think about his conclusions, Kuhn has certainly reminded us that science is very much a social interaction game as much as it is a truth game. Um, so anyways, that's, those are the paradigm shifts. So 
let's, I would encourage you to think one more time. I asked you to reflect on your beliefs about truth at the beginning of this lecture. And I would encourage you one more time, as I do with my face-to-face -face students, to reflect on truth again. And consider, did any of these three views of truth we discussed have an influence on your view of truth? Did you already agree or disagree with one? Just kind of reflect on what you just learned. And remember, either the Descartes view, that truth comes down to certainty, and that the only thing we can be certain of is our own internal thoughts and thus our existence. Or truth could be gained through the scientific method and the testing of different ideas through experimentation and logic and so forth and peer review. Or what we just talked about, you could believe that, well, there really isn't much of a truth at all. There really isn't any objective truth and it's just relative to the community of scientists and they themselves create the rules that define the truth to begin with. So that's more of a sociological analysis of science. Now, there are many people, and I'm one of them, who I do believe in the scientific method, and I actually believe there's some truth to all three of these, um, and I don't necessarily think they all have to be contradictory. So I think we can, and this is my opinion, so I want to make this clear, this won't be on the assessment, this is my opinion trying to synthesize my view of these three, view, these three different perspectives. And I think that in particular, the scientific method certainly helps us find truth. I mean, I'm not going to deny that the amazing camera I'm staring into right now didn't come from our understanding of science, right? That my laptop sitting over there wasn't an indirect result of our understanding of the laws of nature. Of course it was. And so science works. That's the main reason to believe in it. It works. It builds you airplanes. Um, however, the idea that science is some purely objective enterprise is also flawed. Kuhn was clearly right that science, the way it progresses, um, does not happen in a linear fashion. However, my, my thoughts are that even if science is messy and we have corrections to make within it and there's too much dogmatism, it still leads to truth. Right? It, still, it still gets us to the truth. And the main, my main justification is it works. It works. It builds stuff. Right? There's no question about that. So again, you don't have to agree with me there, but that's the way I would synthesize it. And I would hope, to move on to the next slide here, that um, we can acknowledge that we have gone down this road of truth, and we may not all be on the same page. You know, some of you may still be relativists, or you may agree with Descartes, or whatever. Some of you may be diehard scientific method, you may completely disagree with Kuhn, and that's fine. But I'm hoping that we can all kind of push past those abstract difficulties for the rest of the class and just focus on what I'm calling a common sense notion of truth, which is based on the scientific method, but also based on practical open-mindedness and being open to the fact that scientists can get things wrong. Um, so common sense truth might, might also be called in sort of an open-minded sense of truth. And I hope we can push forward with that while always appreciating the value and the different ways of understanding truth, right? So we went down this road to appreciate the difficulty, but we're coming back out so that we can kind of move forward and, and be more or less on the same page. Now, one last thing I got to say um, before we wrap up this, this lecture, and that's to briefly give you the difference between the, um, the balance of consideration and the IBE, or the inference to best explanation. And, um, see my examples here. And so, like I said, the, this is pretty basic to understand. A balance of consideration, as you can see in the image, it's just like creating a scale of scale balance, right? Should I go to San Diego State or should I go to UCSD? Uh, should I go to Berkeley? Should I go to Stanford? Whatever it is. Um, should I go to community college first for a couple years and pay cheap, cheaper for my classes and get my GE done and then transfer or should I go straight to the university? These are all balance of consideration arguments, pros and con lists. And the gist of the argument is you consider pros and cons, but you ultimately reach a conclusion because you ultimately say this particular conclusion has more in favor of it, thus I'm going to do this thing. Right? Inference to best explanation, like I said, is you try to explain something based on your current understanding um, and you offer an argument for what the best explanation is.
so that picture I have there is a famous picture where, you know, you can come up with your own thoughts of, uh, with a dog, what happened, right? Some crazy thing occurred, what happened, what explains it? There's not a clear explanation, let's figure this out. Um, and so that's when an inference to best explanation is most useful. However, notice that an inference to best explanation can also be used in a more grand scale. Uh, people often use the IBE, the inference to best explanation, in relation to God. Right? They might say, well, what's the best explanation for how intelligent human life arose? What's the best explanation for human life? And some people will say, well, God, our life is so complex that the best explanation is that there was a powerful being that created us. Notice that that's clearly an argument because there are different ways it could go. Um, somebody might say, well, no, actually the best explanation for human life is just evolution and the Big Bang. Um, that's all we've observed, that's all we need. So even in highfalutin matters like God, that same logic can apply, can be used as well. Okay, so um, for the rest of it, it's mainly going to come down to you guys um, practicing the classwork and uh, asking me questions if there's anything that's unclear on. I'm going to end the lecture there.